welcome to Kundea. We are here at Fabic Farms. My name is Amadou Chiko Sisoko. I'm a global citizen. I've had the chance to travel different parts of the world. I'm an agriculture investor, a leadership coach, consultant in innovation. And my mission on earth is to help leaders become better so that they can serve people who follow them. One of the gifts I've had is being able to learn how to build you know, profitable businesses that I wanted to help more people build profitable agricultural businesses. Amadou has attempted and failed in different endeavors throughout his life. He dropped out of medical and engineering school in Czech Republic, dropped out of business school in Senegal, started a business there and failed, and after his numerous failures in life, he decided to go back home to Guinea to work on their family farm. There, he established the first agro-tourism retreat in the country, launched an agro-business school. He was a young, dynamic entrepreneur, but he abandoned all of that when he was chosen for Yali, Obama's Young African Leaders Initiative, and from there, instead of going back to Guinea, he went straight to Kenya. In Kenya, he got into coaching and public speaking, started a farm, invested in a business, and pretty much lived there for nearly a decade. In early 2023, he made a decision to return home, back to Fabric Farms where it all started. And here we are operating on 72 hectares of palm trees that we process into palm oil, pineapples that we process into pineapple juice. This farm used to be a colonial farm. The French, when they first came to Guinea, they identified some regions that were very good for bananas, pineapples, and they set up farm there. So if you take this whole region that we are in right now in Kundia, we have different farmers, French farmers who were installed here. And then right after the independence, the French left and some Guineans came and started farming on them. So my grandfather came here in the 1960s or so uh, started farming on this land. Then in the Sekuture regime, Sekuture, any person that had some sort of charisma or some sort of leadership, if you weren't like 100% in the party and you know had your own idea, they would put in jail. So he was part of that group of young leaders who were put in jail. And that time when he was in jail, this place was abandoned, nothing was happening. Then when he got out, he got into real estate, you know, he had some pieces of land that he would sell, build houses and rebuild. So he wanted to now go and buy more land to do more real estate. So he wanted to sell this farm. By then, my mom had a security company with my stepfather. My mom got passionate about this because she wanted to help her father have a legacy. His dream was to have palm trees. So she came and said, OK, rather than you selling this to someone, let me then buy it from you and then I'll make your dream a reality. And that's how it grew in the first few years. We had you know, animal husbandry, cows, sheep, goats. Um, we were producing pineapples and bananas and the palms. So at what point did you decide, okay, you, you are also going in and stepping in and taking over things? I came around 2008, 2009. Uh, it was a way for me to find something to do. I had failed in so many different things, dropped out of medical school, dropped out of engineering school, dropped out of business school, and I was trying to find something that I could do. I didn't come to agriculture as like, I'm coming to be a great farmer. And I don't even, I would never tell someone that I am like super passionate about farming. I'm super passionate about nature, and I'm super passionate about creating wealth. And I was considered like a failure in my family because I had a scholarship, went to Czech Republic, dropped out, dropped out again, came back, tried different businesses, failed, went to Senegal, started business school, dropped out. So they're like, this kid is like, it's crazy. Is that, what is he smoking? Like, is, is, something's wrong with <laughs> yeah, him, right? Oh, yeah. But I, I had a vision that I want to help people help themselves because I grew up in a very difficult environment as a child. You know, my parents divorced while I was in the States as a kid, where I was also, I wasn't very well taken care of. I was being beaten and abused. And so I came back home completely confused to find that my parents are separated. My life is different. It's better than it was you know, in the state. I speak English, everybody speaks French, and I had to like literally find my way. So my entire life, I believe I grew up as someone who was in between two worlds, right? You grew up in a good family, good education, but all your friends and the people you get along with are the poor, people in the street. So I've been like in a mix of so many different people and culture that what I always see in people is the great. I always see the great in people, right? So I wanted a career that allowed me to live that. So when I got discovered coaching, I really went into coaching. I focused on coaching. So coming back to Guinea, after all those failures, 
My mom said, come back home, right? You will restart over. I said, well, I don't want to come work for you. I want to come and work with you, right? I will be your coach. She said, okay, come. <laughs> and I became her coach and I came here. When I came here, it was like a restart for me, you know? So I came and I observed and I saw that there was a lot of potential, but it was really not at its maximum because whenever she was in here and she was in Conakry with the other business, things were not moving. And the people were stealing, they were lying, they were abusing the other employees. That's actually what really got me involved, is that the, the, the guards, the, the workers, they were being bullied by their bosses, right? And then when my mom comes, I see those bosses act like, oh, madame, madame, no, 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 all this hypocrisy, you know? And that's also some of the things that you see when you have parents who are successful is there's a lot of hypocrites around. You know, people always trying to show them that they're doing things when they're not doing them. I felt like I could do something because I had all this knowledge and all this experience of entrepreneurship and helping people. I was like, I can do this. So I got into eggplants and I made money. And during that same time, I used to look around and say, but how can we make this place more profitable? Because right? I dropped out. It didn't mean I didn't continue learning. I learned more about business while I was outside of university than people who went to business school and even were working companies, right? So I started thinking tourism. If I can get someone just like me, the way I enjoy, you know, sitting down under a tree here, writing, reading, if I can get someone to pay to come and do that, then we can monetize. So that's how slowly, slowly I started taking initiative in the business until I became the MD of the business. And by then I was 25, 26. I had about 100 employees or so here that I was managing. I've put my own money into this project. I've put my own, I've stayed here, I've lived here. And it's from here that I had the dream to go and be a world-class speaker. It's from here that I had the dream to go and inspire other people from the world. It's here that I got selected to go and meet the President Obama. It's here that everything I've had in my life had it from here, you know, from this rural farm. I want this place to be a platform on which visionary agriculture investors and entrepreneurs can build their businesses and scale. Right. So when we started, my, the first entrepreneur was my younger sister, because she also was very passionate about processing. So we had a, a place where we used to process oil, and we turned that into a, a, a drying facility. She turned it into a drying facility, and she started drying fruits. From drying fruits, she went into processing and making juice. So that's one entrepreneur that we helped from here. But then there's another one who we were with this morning, Salah. Salah was a, a medical doctor who uh, came here, wanted to learn agriculture. He had one month of fees mm. when we launched the program at the time. One month of fees. And I asked him, I said, well, how are you going to pay for the rest? He said, I'll figure it out. Mm. And I love that. I love that entrepreneurship drive. Like you, right? Like, I want to go tell stories across Africa. And you get in a car and you drive around, you know. I love that. I love people who see something in their mind and then take the risk to pursue it, despite the challenges. So Salah came, we integrated him into the program, and then right after, uh, I got a, a, an organization, IOM, to, to pay and sponsor students to come and learn here. Yeah. And we integrated him into that program. So he didn't have to pay anymore, because he was here. So he went with those guys, we taught them how to do pineapples, how to do bananas, vegetables, and then the program, we gave them tools, and then I put in the program to give them land. So I gave them land somewhere in the farm for them to start. I'm telling you, these guys went from one hectare that we gave them, they now have one and a half hectare of their own. In addition to mentoring and assisting young entrepreneurs on the farm, Amadou has found a way to include people who have the passion for agriculture but do not have the time. He created an option for these people to invest and profit from agriculture. Last year, we launched the Pineapple Investment Project. So this pineapple, we and a lady in France are producing this. This pineapple, this guy also is in France. Uh, I'll show you another one. That guy is in Canada, right? Another guy is in the US. So how does that work? Like how much do they invest in and then what are the returns and things like that? So our investment model is called co-production. So we invest 50%, you invest 50%. So let's say the cost of producing one hectare, right, of pineapple is $20,000, right? So we're gonna share that cost with you. You're gonna take 10,000, we're gonna take 10,000. 
the return on investment for pineapple, because it's a luxury product, right? Like it's a luxury agricultural product. So if we have invested those 20,000, we're gonna get around 40 to 60% return. That's what we promise our investors. So let's say 40% on the bottom side. So you're getting 40% over two years, which is gonna give you for $20,000, you're gonna get $8,000 profit on top. So we're gonna split that 8,000 into four. So you've invested 10,000, in two years, you go home with $14,000 as a return. That's at the minimum. Now, the higher side, we can go up to 60%. So then for a $10,000 investment over two years, you get 16,000. The one hectare that you have signed up for will not be shared with anyone, right? It's only you and us who are investing in that. And we give you a title deed on that piece of land for two years. So I'll put like your details in the description box if people want to, you know, reach out or no whatever, problem. your emails. Yeah. Contact. The guide, investment guide is there. The investment contract is there. Mm -hmm. We share with them. They review it. Sometimes they share with their, their family members, their lawyers. They have a view. Then, you know, we agree. Mm -hmm. And others even, they, they invest and then they come to visit. Mm -hmm. So if they're, you know, from another country... They're looking at different investment options and they really want to come back to Africa. We tell them, Guinea has very favorable laws for immigration for people who invest in agriculture. Mm -hmm. So if you invest with us, for example, and you invest over two, three, four, you can get the nationality. Mm -hmm. And you never know. We have the biggest mining project in the world that is being developed here, Simandu, mm -hmm. which is going to open up another more infrastructure for agriculture. Mm -hmm. So I'm just projecting in the future, looking for people who have the same vision right and and have the capital to come and invest with us this is such a great model and i'm curious to know where he got the idea and vision to get people to invest produce together and then sell the produce to manufacturers like his sister who runs a pineapple processing factory within the farm yeah so if you if you, if you go abroad i've seen that in other countries where they have these uh, they take this land and then they subdivide it and either they sell it as real estate so people can come build houses for sale or they build a house and they sell you or they divide it and then they, they rent it out for agriculture, right? I saw all those models. So I was looking at, we have 72 hectares of land here. I can get people to come and I subdivide the land and say, okay, come and work. But there's a lot of land also across Guinea. So why would, someone can go to another land, right? He wants to do in his village, he would do, do that. Even if you give someone land today, if they don't have the time, they don't have the knowledge, they don't have the resources to do it, they're gonna fail. So I said, let's study this. Let's study this as an investment model, right? Let's look at how are people making money from pineapple and then how do you share that to a large number of people? And the model was for us that you first have to have the land. Okay, we have the land, we have the expertise. You have to have a market. We have a factory. So we have a market on the same farm. So what's left? Capital. So capital, I could raise my own capital but the vision of you know, making people wealthy, you can't just think of yourself, right? So I'm like, why don't I create a fund where people can invest with us, we produce pineapple together, and then when we harvest, we share the profit. So it's maybe less profit for me now, but in 10 years time, if I've made a lot of people wealthy through this, together we could be the largest consortium of pineapple producers on the continent. So if you look at it in 10 years, you're like, ah, it makes sense to go through this hard part now of getting people involved, getting people to trust, getting people to invest, making sure that they get their money back and then from there keep growing. And then as more people trust and more people invest, you know, your fund keeps growing. And then you can go from pineapple to banana to papaya to rice. You can go from Guinea to the Gambia to, to, to Ivory Coast to Nigeria because you have a working model and you have people who trust your business model. So in a few, few months, we're going to harvest them. So we put these on top to avoid the, the sunburn. So tell me, why pineapples to be specific? Like, why pineapples? Why not start with something else? Man, come on. Why not pineapple? Look at my socks. I told you, right? I have pineapple socks, right? You know why? Pineapple is the fruit, like orange, that is produced in just a few countries, but consumed in every country in the world because there are factories across the world in countries that don't produce these fruits that actually import these fruits, process them, and then serve their populations. That's why it's also expensive to produce, right? If I want to do one hectare of pepper, it could cost me maybe $1,500, maximum $3,000, I'll do a hectare. But for a hectare of pineapples, I'm in the $20,000 investment. But 
the return is also greater. It takes, its cycle is about 18 months from the moment you plant before you get the fruit. It's a great product for me that I've grown up with. Uh, my country is uniquely positioned, right? Like I got people who, when they saw what we're doing here, they said, okay, why don't you come and do this pineapple in the Gambia, right? That's how I, you know, when I went to visit. I was like, I would love to, but it's not possible to do it at the scale of this in the Gambia, because one, how are you, where are you gonna get 50, 60, 100 acres of land that you can irrigate, right? Uh, that is, land is there. No, land is there, but the type of land mm. that you can be able to grow pineapple on, right? That's what, that's not, that's what you're not gonna get, right? Secondly, when you look at the, the rain, right? You want rain, here we have maybe six months of rain, right? So if you have six months of rain, you know uh, in your 18 month cycle, you have 12 months, right, that you'll be watering. But if you have only two months of rain, if you have only three months of rain, and maybe the rain is very short or the rain is very intense, you're gonna be watering for a large amount of, and that's a cost that you have to bear. Where are you getting that water from, right? So in, in, in the Gambia, for example, I would do peanuts, I would do mangoes, right? You have very great mango export, you have good cashew export, you have tourism and ecotourism. So every country, every region has its, its strength. Thanks. We are a mining and agricultural country. Right? Like I, I urge people, come invest in a country like this before people understand. Right? Because we're in ECOWAS. I can go invest in the Gambia today. Build a hotel in the Gambia. Why not? I know tourism in the Gambia is much better than tourism in Guinea. We have a lot of tourism potential, but the infrastructure is not the same as in the Gambia. So why would I uh, spend a million dollars building you know, a world-class retreat in Guinea and then having to convince people to come to Guinea when there are people already coming in the Gambia, I can go build that retreat there and I'll already have customers even before I launch, right? But why would I go and build a multi-million dollar pineapple project in the Gambia, right, where I have no guarantee that I'm going to have enough water, enough land, and uh, the, 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 the market is there, but it's not the Gambia. The market would be Senegal. The market would be... Export business. Exactly. It would be export. The goal and the vision is to be the largest exporter of pineapple in the world. By 2035, 2040, I believe we can achieve that. We can be amongst the top, right? Because in the colonial times, Guinea was one of the world's largest exporters of bananas. These lands were occupied by the French. They were producing bananas here. There was a railroad that the bananas go here on the railroad. They go straight to the port and they go to France, right? The French, when they did the map of West Africa, Guinea was positioned as, as an agricultural hub, right? So for me, being a leader, third generation in this business, it's my responsibility also to use what I have found and add on to it to be able to now elevate the country. You know, my mom came, her vision was to elevate the community. For me, I want to really elevate the agricultural industry of the country, right? Show people that, you know, um, we can do great things, even despite all the challenges we have. This sector is resilient. There's going to be a World War III, there's going to be challenges, there's going to be political riots, there's going to be whatever. But if you have crops in the soil, if your money is in food, you're going to get that money back. I asked him what advice he has for young Africans like myself who want to contribute positively on the continent since he has trained some of the most promising young leaders and entrepreneurs on the continent. I would say, first of all, know your strengths, right? What are you strong in? What is special about you? Second, what are the low-hanging opportunities around you or what you know and what you have as a special to be expressed? But to find that out, you have to look for problems. What are the problems in your environment that you can solve using your gifts. Don't go solve a problem that is far once you've, if you've not solved a problem that is near. near. After you've found the problems and the opportunities to solve, fix yourself measurable goals. Say, okay, by this date in 10 years, this is who I want to be. Like go 10 years in the future, like 2034, and talk as the guy of 2034, talk to the guy of now mm. and tell him, this is what you will do. You will accomplish this and this and this. Right, right, right. Set goals 10 years in the future and then start for the next 100 days. So you have your vision. In 10, 20 years, we're going to make of Guinea the agricultural hub, a powerhouse in West Africa, in Africa. What can I do now 
Now, now, now is I need to secure investors for this. Now, 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 I need to get a good team. Now, 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 I need to automate my system. Now, 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 I need to do this and that. Now, that that you need to do in the 100 days is a small. It doesn't need to be big, just something small. What small thing can you do so that you, in yourself, you feel every day, I am moving one step forward? Exactly. Mm. That one step forward towards your dream, when it's consistent, your dream is also walking towards you. Which industries would you advise people to invest in in Africa? People would say I'm biased because I'm in agriculture. Let's just forget agriculture because people would say I'm biased. But mm-hmm. for me, mm-hmm. um, the one thing I wouldn't tell people about looking at a sector, I would say develop your innovative mind, right? Because at first, you're not necessarily going to prosper in the sector that you want or the sector that you think is hot, it's the one that's going to work for you at that particular time. That's, that's how I look at it. Is your passion doesn't necessarily going to lead you to profit. Mm. Right? You may be passionate about something. You love doing it. You have some skills in it. But it doesn't make money in your place, in the environment you're in. Follow the money first. Right? Try out different things until you build up some capital for yourself. Once you have capital, then you can now invest in things that can now grow. But you have to try things to see what you're good at and what pays you back. That's why I say develop your innovative thinking. Because innovative thinking means you do things that lead to profit. Not just new. Creating a new product that doesn't sell is not innovation Mm, to me. right? right? It has to either save you money or make you gain money. So wherever you're already making money is where you should be improving. Now, when you have the money, And you have the knowledge of your ecosystem. Mm. You can now identify businesses that work for you and that grow your money. I don't have a degree. I don't have any type of engineering, agricultural background. But I I saw how to turn this into a profit. So we have to change our mindset and stop saying, oh, I have to be this. We're not a continent where opportunities are a dime a dozen for everybody. You can just become whoever you want to be. That's not reality. In our continent, poverty is there. Disease is there. Corruption is extreme. There are uh, uh, authoritarian governments, restrictions. We live in a very difficult environment, more difficult than what we see on YouTube and in movies. True. So let's true. stop dreaming about saying, oh, uh, I, I can be whoever I dream to be. It's not true. For you to be whoever you want to be, first you have to be someone you don't want to be until you get to where you want to be. So I tell people, find your way, find your way by where are you making an income? Because in Africa, the job is the biggest impact one can create. Mm. By creating a job, you're changing someone's life. You're giving them dignity mm. that they don't have to beg anyone to have a living. You see all those guys who are working there? Every time they get paid, they get to feed their families. They don't go beg anyone for anything. So they can walk proud in in their families, in their neighborhood. They can walk proud because they know my work, my sweat, gives me a resource. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you so much for watching. And this was a very, you know, insightful, interesting, inspiring video. My pleasure, man. Thank you for coming to Guinea. And I have to say, you are going to be one of the greatest entrepreneurs in this continent. I guarantee you 100%. I can put put my head to cut on that because for the past 10, 15 years, I've been training, coaching the most promising young people on the continent. And when I watch one video, I heard you talking. I was like, this young man. Is gonna be someone great, and now God has brought us together. So definitely, uh, we're gonna do great things Thank together. Thank you so much, brother. Yo.